Well, no, the whole point is that I just occurred. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, that's the whole tell. Thing? Yeah. Is this working? Yeah. I think I was thinking about is get the. Um, well, I, I was going to say, now what you can do is. Can help you okay. With well, see, that's part of why I've got the tape recorder on is because I forget so, the names of the where people. Where do you want to go? And I, I well, I was going to say maybe anywhere. you could just <laughs> while you're talking since you're talking about this. Mm -hmm. Where was the ballroom? This is a three-story building. Yeah, that, that, up Where's at the Where's the top. ballroom? Up at That's the top? That's the courtroom. And that was the courtroom? Yeah. Where was the and, bowling alley? <laughs> and that woman was in the bottom there. You, you see those steps going up? Okay. And as soon as you got up, there were steps that went down. Uh -huh. And the ones that went down on this side went to the sheriff's office right there on the lower on the left. On the left, yeah. okay. And the justice of peace was on the lower right. Is that the little door him, that's down mm, there? Yeah. Okay. And the one above that was my office, the county oh. judge. Okay. And the one over here was a school superintendent, and Alicia, and that room there, which is not hardly as big as this, anyway, it isn't as big as this. Mr. Lawton ran the entire public school system with one secretary. <laughs> they had one typewriter. <laughs> what is this room that's got the windows uh, that's, that's poked just, out? That's just uh, when you're going upstairs. Is it just a, a hallway? It's a, it's a foyer. To you. There's a double stairway and a landing right here. Okay. And then there's a, you go up to the, to the big courtroom with doors there. Okay. Which well, what would the bowling ballroom. alley become when it became a courthouse? Oh, there are offices down there. Offices. And, and, uh, what is this right next door that looks like a garage or that's something? That's the old Seminole Tire Shop, but it's been taken down. That's where the Empire no, it, Savings Bank is down there. Is what was Freedom? Was mm -hmm. Freedom Savings and Loan? Mm -hmm. It's empty now. Yeah, yeah, now there was nothing from this edge all the way to the lakefront. That was just a big field, and I always knew that would be where we needed to build our we, courthouse. Well, you know, we were trying to figure out this picture. You can see, let's see. If you look, it's looking towards the waterfront. When we had it out of the case, it looks like it's looking towards where the flag is. You can just barely see in the center, uh -huh. behind the big pile of dirt way at the yeah. back, there's the memorial back there. Yeah. That's where we're trying to figure out what piece of land this would be. I think this was between the, what would be now the post office over here and the courthouse, that okay. big parking lot. <coughs> and by oh. the way, in the Here's 1950s, in the 1950s, I saw mm -hmm. that the water over the lake overflowed the bulkhead, and water was up there in front of that courthouse. Because oh. I had to look out my window and see the water. Now, down what the caused street. that? Uh oh, the there was just Which, flooding just conditions rain? and rain. Yeah, yeah. Now, see, I thought that was the whole reason that the bulkhead was put in was to stop that from. Yeah, happening. but and I believe it was in '52 <laughs> the water went over that bulkhead four times. Oh, really? Yeah. Because we've got this picture down here, which I've been told is Hurricane Donna. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, Donna was 60, and that's about right. Is yeah. That, mm -hmm. yeah. that okay. actually, Donna actually walked, washed out just one short uh, span of base of property uh, on the Lakefront Boulevard out there, just washed it in. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. How far now, up did it flood? Because that's Park Avenue. Well, it went up, up, went up in front of the courthouse. So it went up there, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that was our city hall, which which I always thought was a beautiful building, and, and I was so sorry they tore that thing down. But the top floor was what we call the celery crate, and that's where the children, the high school students, we had our dances. And uh, I would guess that 90% of the children in this county learned to dance right in up there. In that room? <laughs> yeah. Was the hole upstairs? The uh, well. When you went in that door to the right, that tower there you yeah, see right. was a stairway. Oh, and it okay. took you up to the second floor. And it was, it was, and there was a stage at the other end where okay. the bands played. I've seen uh, Elton Moton's uh, family has got a photograph that shows the inside of that. Yeah, and really, the, the, it wasn't anything wrong with what the city did with the new city hall but somehow that building should been have nice. been preserved. is this sitting where the parking lot now is the city mm -hmm. parking lot is that yeah. about where that was yeah. okay yeah. Uh, somebody had told me i thought that when they built the new city hall did they build it right next door and then they tore this down after they got everybody moved um because the new yeah. city hall sits yeah, where the zoo was happened. right yeah it was taken down later mm -hmm. so it they moved sure the zoo was. and then built the city hall where the zoo moved. was the other zoo went out you know to its present location right and they built the new city hall uh, to accommodate 
future growth of Sanford, and it was very wise. And then after the complete move was made, they tore down the old city hall. I've forgotten what year the city hall came down, and even what year the courthouse came down, but those were the two most important buildings that we had in this <laughs> city and county, you know. And uh, this thing really had an interesting history, the courthouse. We don't have a lot of information. on The buildings that are gone, we don't have... But when was that built? Mm -hmm. built well, there. it had to have been around the turn of the century because it really was the, I've been told all my life, the, the most, uh, the nicest Elks Club in the state of Florida. Of course, that you know at that time, Sanford was here and Miami wasn't there. <laughs> and all those other towns. Was it just for there. Sanford or was it the Elks yeah, Club for the whole it, area? No, it, uh, it was a Sanford Lodge. And, uh, but I think they had, they just overbuilt and had too much to handle. So when the county was formed in 1913, they sold it to the county and that became our county courthouse. And the superintendent was that white section on the left, the county judge was on the right, the sheriff was down here. Okay. In the back was the tax collector and the tax assessor and the clerk of the court. Oh, okay. Now, I, was there a parking lot? Uh, Did you no, park on the street? No, there was no parking lot. The tire shop, old Seminole tire shop was on the right. No, people okay. just parked on the street. Now we haven't told the jail was back behind the jail, Hall, Both right? the county and the city was jail. There? Was, is was that what's showing in the back mm -hmm, there or is that something yeah. else? Okay. It was a long building, Alicia, and on um, the side closest to the lake was the city jail and the side, and the, uh, the side toward First Street was the county jail. Okay. Mm-hmm. It sure was. Let's see if there's anything. Do you remember when the band show went down? when they tore that down? Or why they tore it down? No, I, I can't don't. find anybody who knows why. It was, I, I, there aren't that uh, many people who remember it, actually. Well, it, it got in terrible condition. I remember that. And, uh, Do you ever remember actually going to anything? Oh, there? sure. I remember, uh, I remember uh, on Easter morning, 1946, the, the, all the churches went together and had an Easter morning service there. And I came down with my wife and uh, my son, and we parked down there. And the speaker was a Dr. Pope Duncan, who was a young man who later be became the president of Stetson University and is our chancellor now. And he spoke on the subject of crisis, and it just rang out all over the, <laughs> the place. And then we had, uh, we had uh, amateur shows down there when oh, really? folks would come down and sing and dance and things like that. And Did it actually have built-in seats? I mean, were there, were there seats or a folding chair? Uh, yeah, there was one on? time there were some seats, not a whole lot, but there were some seats in the front of that thing. Okay. And, um, and they'd put the loudspeaker equipment up and, and uh, th yeah, there were a lot of programs down there. And the, you see in the 30s, in the late 20s and 30s, long before air conditioning and television and even drive-in movies, um, the, the, the you, it, entertainment was very simple. And th that field right there to the right of that thing was a softball field. And that's oh, right over here yeah, at the edge of the yeah, field? Yeah, we oh. had most active softball teams here. And, um, and when the World Series was played, well, they put a big board up downtown, and 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 the what happened? Like if Babe Ruth got a home run, it would mm -hmm. come in over the wire, and they would they would show up there Ruth at bat, and then they would move a white thing to first base, to third base, to, and everybody knew he had a home run in the chair. Where was that? Where was it the, at the field? Uh, right down that? there on the main corner. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. so like if you're walking down doing business or something, you could see the sign would tell you what was going on. With yeah, downtown. and everybody would come uptown to see the... Like uh, Times Square or something. <laughs> everybody would come uptown to see, particularly the World Series time. And then they did that sometimes over in, on the on the, on the wall up by the Herald, Herald Building, which was on Magnolia. Oh, right. But see, mm -hmm. things were simple. Uh, so that bandstand was used That's for... Important. For... Um, entertainment and uh, 
Do you have any idea what that building is that's next to it? See the thing sticking out in the water next to it? Oh, yeah, that was the old yacht club, and the Qantas oh. and Rotary Club and Lions Club, the civic clubs, met there until the new, um, the new civic center was opened right. in the 50s. Oh. And uh, the, uh, that was a yacht club. And we met there. When the year I was president of Qantas in 1953, I, I held my meetings right there. JC's met. Now, the the floors, <laughs> there were cracks between the, the 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 boards and the floor, and we didn't have proper heat. In the, no one ever had proper heat in there, Alicia. And during the winter time, on really cold days with metal chairs, you know, these uh -huh. metal chairs, uh -huh. you go down there and that wind would come up on those cracks and you would sit out in those metal chairs and you just about froze. <laughs> it was so cold. But when the new Civic Center was open over here, okay. right over here, mm -hmm. uh, you, we there, there's a place and then that's when we moved. But that was used. Um, well, where well, did people, now if that was the yacht club, where'd you put your yacht? I mean, oh, where are oh, the boats? See, There's no marina. See, that, the well, boats? no, but uh, there were some places along there you could. And then, you see, uh, at one time, all the oil, gas came in here. Well, the major companies a little bit further Yeah, I know out. it was a tank farm. We don't, I don't think we have a Did picture. You know We've that? got one that has... Well, we got to rid that. of that under the leadership of John Kreider. I've never understood why was that... What was that tank farm for? Was it like a central oh, place sure. or something? Oh, sure. See, Sanford, uh, that's the thing that people need to really understand here. Um, you see, we were the major community mm -hmm. uh, for a long time. We know that from way back, sure. but I didn't realize up until... This and is, these then are barges. when Tampa developed, you see, we were the major community, really, until... Um, uh, between Jacksonville and Tampa, so just like in the old days, the freight would come down the river and be distributed from Fort Mellon, mm -hmm. uh, originally Camp Monroe down there, and be taken as far as Tampa. President, so, the, so this oil coming in here was just continuing. Came, that yeah, same and tradition. the trucks would pick it up there and just. So it was like it. what a barge would come up mm -hmm. and, and the, unload at this tank farm, that's and right. then the trucks would come that's and take right. it. So yeah. was that the standard oil or standard oil was here all a long time ago? Yeah, all of them would use all that. Them were here. Okay. And I'll tell you who could give you re all the information you want on that is Earl Higginbotham, about whom the Herald recently had quite a feature story. Okay. Earl is in his 80s, still alive. He's a cattleman. And uh, he has been the agent of Standard Oil here for, gosh, 40, 50 uh -huh. years. Okay. But anyway, things changed, and oil, there became other ways to get the oil out. And uh, so it was an eyesore. Mm -hmm. And then about 19, the early 60s, Mr. Kreider, who was the executive secretary of the chamber, and a former county commissioner, a former mayor, and a former major league baseball player. Got a group together and we fi we put up the money and we bought all the land down there from the people that owned it. Mm -hmm. Where the sale oh, point right. mm -hmm. is, sale point. And just as a community thing, mm -hmm. the bank- Just to get rid of the, the tanks. The bank loaned us the money, for, but we signed for it, you see. And we held that property for a long time, and finally it was sold, and 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 we have those apartments down there now. Yeah. But all this other thing goes back to an earlier day, and it was a it was an eyesore. Somebody told me they actually picked the tanks up and like floated them, or took them down the river. You mean when they got rid of them? When they got rid of them. I don't know. Okay. I remember that. <laughs> you told me I some colorful our... story about these things going down, the, like they turned them upside down and mm -hmm. took them down the river. It's feasible. But see, Alicia, people have always been critical of Sanford because uh, General Sanford saw, and really the reason he picked this place out was because of the river mm -hmm. and yeah. Lake Monroe Sea, and, and he foresaw that that uh, Sanford would be quite a hub as a distribution mm -hmm. center of every kind of everything. Now, what people didn't realize was that you not only had to bring thing in, things in, but you had to send things Something. back. And there well, wasn't he, anything to well, send back. Well, he tried back. to do that with the oranges, and that didn't succeed. Then that didn't work, yeah. you see. Yeah. It didn't work. And so 
the result was that uh, the the trucking industry and the railroad industry Chicago. grew. We had quite a railroad center, mm -hmm. and we've been terribly criticized our predecessor generations before me, and I guess ours, because the lake was never utilized in the way that many people today foresee. I mean, it's a recreation. Yeah. Like, well, yeah. all kind of things. Well, see, we I made a horrible mistake when the city began to, to dump the sewage in there, and all that's been stopped, you know, and cleaned up. Sanford has done a great job on that, but when I was a boy, all the sewage came from the whole city right out in the river. And, um, was there some place in particular that it dumped, or was all it just, down, down just the main everywhere. part of town? Yeah, okay. was, and uh, but that was a common thing to do in the United States in those days. People didn't know anything about. Uh, I think there seems to be kind of. A, I thought it was alligators, but maybe it was pollution. Nobody see it. No one swims in the lake. I mean, people live oh, on this no, lake, and no one, no, no one, no one, no one no we goes were in the lake. Uh, Is so it because of the fact, alligators or the sewage? No, I don't remember anything <laughs> about the alligators. It was the sewage. But okay. you're taking that ballpark right there. Yeah. The, every now and then somebody would hit a foul ball and it would bounce in the street and bounce in the water. Well, we kids of my age, uh, 8, 10, 12 years old back in, in those days, uh, if we went in there and got the water, it, get, got there, we got to keep the ball. <laughs> And not many kids would go in, go in the water. And I don't think my mother ever knew that Julian and I were going in that water, <laughs> but we'd go in there and get the, the softball. And, uh, but to see that the lake was full of sewage. I would, because there's, uh, there are people, Whoa. you know, no one. There's no one goes in the lake. It seemed to be oh, one of the things that no, first struck no, me no, when no, I moved no, here is that no, no one, no. no one who lives here goes in the lake. Tourists will come and go no. out there on those sailboards no, or something. Nobody, but now actually there's no sewage in, in the lake. But, but, but it may just be tradition. People didn't grow up. I think that's lake, the you know. case that, that everybody, yeah. But in in the early days, well, goodness, they didn't un, get unhealthy. the sewage out of the river. Until but it was just something that we cut out in the paper that was about our uh, terribly advanced waste treatment that we now have, and yeah. I think it's only been, Cynthia, was that been 10 years ago they built the sewage treatment plant? The big one, that's that one you're talking about, yeah. So it's like 1980 or something, because they well, started Well, we got this. the sewage out of the city, the got the sewage out of the river before then, mm. but um, that's a shame that, yeah. that, that they ever did that. Now, when the interstate came along, I could see when, when, when they told me that Orlando was going to put the interstate right through the middle of town. I think I may have told you that mm -hmm. once, but uh, Mr. Dial, who's still alive, and was our road commissioner and uh, was later head of the Sunbanks and a great lawyer, he called me one day and he said, Senator, I want you to tell me within 30 days where you want this interstate to come through your county. And I said, all right, I'll get back with you. And I got the county commissioners down in the basement of the old courthouse because by this time the Sunshine Law, which I was one of the original authors, had passed the legislature, which meant the governmental bodies could not meet right. except in the sunshine. But this was early on, and uh, I, I got them down in the old basement of the courthouse, and I said, now, Orlando is going to put that interstate right through the middle of town. And we can come in at the foot of, of Sanford Avenue. And we can come in at the foot of... They would have cut of, it right through the middle of town. We can come in the Park Avenue. We can come in at the foot of French Avenue. Or we can put it out west of Sanford. Now, uh, I had been down to Fort Myers, and there's a bridge that comes right into town there, and they had developed uh, quite a marina on both sides of that bridge mm -hmm. in some recreational area, and, and I, the, the lake was not deep a lot of times. It's, it's mm -hmm. really not deep on the sides. It's five miles across. And uh, I could foresee if, if the, we brought the interstate across, it would be a big fill on oh. both sides, and they could be developed into developed wonderful into recreational areas okay. and everything else. The trouble was, if you came down Sanford Avenue, you would clean out Georgetown, which was a historic black community. Mm -hmm. The merchants, and no one wanted the interstate to come down uh, Park Avenue, 
you can see what that would have done. Same thing it did to Orlando, split the town. And if you had come down Sanford Avenue, you would have affected Goldenrod, uh, Goldsboro, which is another black community, and the right-of-way would have been expensive. And the result was that one day Dow called me, and he said, uh, did you all decide where you want it? And I said, uh, Billy, our merchants and our public officials don't want this thing downtown. I said, frankly, I can see some advantages to it. But I can't find anybody that wants this thing to come through the middle of Sanford. And he said, well, where do you want it? We need to know. I said, put it three and a half miles from the French Avenue red light. Is that where it is? That's exactly <laughs> where it is. It's three and a half miles from French Avenue for red light. Now, one of the things, of course, this was before Disney World. I was going to ask what year this is, because See, is this when downtown was still thriving I mean there were still businesses downtown what? and oh yeah we had yeah. we had a nice yeah there were there were enough people yeah. downtown that they wanted yeah. to keep downtown yeah. see yeah. nowadays I'm not so sure if you offered to put the interstate through the middle <laughs> I don't know well the uh, this was before Disney World okay. but even at the time I had a lot of reservations Alicia about uh, the, the wisdom of the Orlando power structure uh, in uh, putting that thing through the middle of Orlando. Now the reason for that was that was our major thoroughfare for people going to the west coast of Florida when they would come down I-95 to Daytona right. okay. and start toward anywhere down that part of Florida. They would have to be going on Interstate 4 or would choose Interstate 4. And that meant that Orlando was saying that we're going to have all the tourists, of which we had millions, Mm -hmm. going to Tampa and Clearwater and St. Pete and Fort Myers and Naples and the whole coast and spots in between. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be traveling on the same road going into Orlando where people that went to Orlando to work every morning would be traveling. <laughs> See, the folks that were going to be working downtown <laughs> in the banks and downtown in the courthouse and the city hall and and at that, All the people this, who now sit yeah, in <laughs> We had some shopping centers then, but nothing like now. But, of course, it was just a matter of three or four years later when uh, Walt Disney people selected this site. And what happened was that, uh, and what is happening today, is that all the millions of tourists that are going to Walt Disney World and all the millions of tourists that are going from the east coast of Florida, the west coast, plus all the people working downtown are clogged up. And it turned out that our decision, which I had, I had questions about for years. For three and a half miles mm, out. <laughs> I really wondered whether that was a crucial decision, and I knew it was crucial. And uh, I wondered, I, I wasn't sure that, that, that we were right, but I was just a senator, and, and uh, I, I respected the county commission and the Merchants Association and the other legislators. And, but I wondered about it. And then about 10 years after that, <laughs> one morning it dawned on me how nice it is to have 40 and 50 and 60,000 cars a day passing three and a half miles from our town <laughs> from, a, from an environmental right. standpoint. Yeah. I also knew that that corridor, Alicia, between Orlando and Daytona would, could be developed industrially. And the problem that we had here, ever since the cell removed and not having any industry, we had no outside capital coming in to our town. And the result was that everybody that lived in the north end of the county was spending each other's money. The only way the per capita oh. wealth of a community can grow... You have to have new money. That's right. And okay. the farming provided that. But when the farming left, we didn't have all this... Okay, now that's one of the things that we get when we get the tour here. We talk about Henry Sanford's idea and about the boats and the oranges and the oranges failing. Then we get to celery. Then we hit this question, which is, what happened to the celery? Well, what happened to the? What happened to the? We burned the soil up. I say we. Uh, I, I, my family. My my grandfather was one of the first farmers. I'll show you that in a book I just brought in here. But um, my father, my grandfather, uh, had the first dairy here yeah, in this yeah. county. And my grandmother was the first, operated the first school. 
But what happened was, this now was before we had agricultural agents in each county mm -hmm. and agricultural experiment stations connected with the University of Florida. And so our people didn't know anything about scientific farming. And they just planted and planted and planted and burnt the soil up. So you just reach a year where your crop isn't as well, good and we, it gets we, worse and that's worse? That's right. And, and the okay. advantage in growing the celery was moved on to Bradenton and Sarasota and down around Okeechobee. Okay. Somebody else who's got good soil starts to take over as yours right. is starting that's, to fail. That's the okay. truth now. There's no question about that. That's what happened. And any of the old-time farmers would tell you that. About now, what year, what decade did that start to Well, fade? we didn't have the celery after the war that we really? had uh, that we had before the war. It wasn't all gone. We had farming out on Celery Avenue and out west First Street. So they really after the that there wasn't any new 50s. money? No, in. and not only that, you see Sanford had attracted um, a great number of black uh, citizens to work in the who would work in the fields. The black okay. people would come in here, and it provided employment in Sanford, Florida, for people that would work for celery fields. Mm -hmm. And there was a story in the Herald the other day about Frank Wheeler's, right, that out, who's yeah. uh, one of my oldest friends and dearest friends. And the, um, but we we had all all of our black folks. You see, when in 1930, um, 50 percent of Sanford was black and 50 percent was white. I didn't realize it was happening. Yeah. And they had no work which is why the Depression hurt this town about as bad as, it, as any community that I know anything about in Central Florida, because we, we just, we didn't have any work. But anyway, back to the thing, I could see, if you, if you looked at a map and got up in the air and looked at it, that one day the area between Daytona and Orlando would be, uh, would be an ideal area for industrial development. Mm -hmm. which meant jobs for our children getting out of high school who mm -hmm. were not academically inclined or being inclined couldn't do academic collegiate work. Now, I didn't foresee in those days that uh, as many youngsters would be going to college, even though I had was one of the uh, floor leaders for the passage of our Community College Act. It established we got 28 of them now where the children could get to 13th and 14th <clears throat> grades. I still felt like, and we had one of the very first vocational training schools for young people in, in Sanford. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. through our school system. And the first time <laughs> I went down the interstate, which was the morning we had Senator Smathers here, and he cut the ribbon. I realized that it was nine solid miles between 46, State Road 46 and State Road 434, and you could not get off of that interstate to get to Sanford. So I started then on Lake Mary Boulevard, and we, the Lake Mary Chamber of Commerce, got in it deep, Donald Jackson. Gino Paulucci helped us every way he could. It took us five years, and we got the first interchange on Interstate mm -hmm. 4 between Daytona and St. Petersburg, the very first one, very That's first great. one. And someday, another time, I'll tell you the story how that happened. And sure enough, I was the MC the day that we, we uh, broke ground. Sure enough, when that thing opened up, we began to get failures. And the first thing you know, Stromberg Carlson right. came in. Mm -hmm. And folks, our so unemployment exactly rate thought. down on French Avenue and Second Street, the unemployment office, the unemployment rate in this county began to drop. It's 5.3 today, which is good. Began to drop. And then National Cash Register, and you can go out there and see that corridor, mm -hmm, you see. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, and it opened up the western side of the county, it, not only for industrial purposes, but um, beautiful, beautiful land that had never been used before, and now we've, you know. So is that mostly what, because we were trying to figure that out the other day, is that those those industrial parks and that, is that mostly where the money's coming into Sanford now? 
the new money. Yeah, plus... Uh, Companies like that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. plus uh, we still have... Because we do have a lot of tourists come in and they want to know what the economic base is now and where the money's coming from. And well, we do have, we've tried to figure out, because Cardinal Industries we knew well, used to be big oh, and then they went... Gee, did that yeah. help us. Cardinal helped us tremendously. The airport has never received the credit that, uh, that it deserves for Sanford's recovery. Oh, really? oh no. Oh. No. People, I don't believe half well, the I mean, people in Sanford, right? We now don't know. I mean, because know I, what, we know that we know the air station was there, and then it was turned yeah. over, and yeah. it became the city airport. But I mean, no, we don't know much about well, what goes on out there all either. All kind of businesses out there, which uh, bring in new money, and uh, people here don't realize it, but the but that airport is going to be a major airport before this thing is all over with, and uh, we have new money there. Uh, we still have some farming interests like the Dudas family and the Wheelers out there, but uh, but there isn't really. Then we have a bunch of retired people. Yeah. In this area, we don't still have any really we big farmers anymore, do we? No, big, we don't. Major we, no, you can't. Because the Chase family's out of it. Yeah, you know? uh, yeah, and the freezes have wiped out again the, the citrus industry. Like my brother Frank, he planted back three times and gave up. Now, Alicia, this is a good point to say this. People say, well, we've always had freezes. No, we have not always had freezes. We had a terrible freeze in 1895. That's we the one that wiped out everybody sure. and, and we wiped out the And we had cold weather when I was a child in grade school and middle school and high school and all like that. But we had orange groves all over this place. Okay, well that's, and we don't have them anymore, and it's well, because that, we had four freezes in five years around here, that's right. and uh, two in one year, and every time these people, the young trees were frozen, they fellows, the farmers would plant back, and they gave up, and, get hit again. and we, we don't have our citrus anymore. Because that's another mystery we've got, is we know that Sanford had all the success with tropical plants, oh, all kinds of things, sure. and the 94, 95, they all got wiped out. And then we talk about the celery and everything, but what we're not clear on is when the citrus came back. Because we know some of the Swedes left because their citrus got wiped out. Yeah. And then other people went into celery. But so what you're telling me is there really was a lot of citrus here oh, when you were growing up here. Oh, my goodness, a lot. So somewhere along the way, yeah, somebody yeah. decided to try it again. Uh, as a side note, Alicia, when we were youngsters, um, we didn't have what they called juvenile delinquency. Mm -hmm. which they don't call it that anymore, they call it out-and-out out crime, but when I was a young judge, it was called juvenile delinquency. We never heard of that when I was going okay. through school, so far as all these things that are going on. But the worst thing we ever did was, boys, if somebody had an old car, which was very few of them, we'd get in the car and uh, uh, on a Friday night or a Saturday night we'd go out to some orange grove and go in there and get us uh, a bunch of oranges Sorry, and oranges. come down on the lakefront and <laughs> eat them. See, that's okay. about the worst thing we did. <laughs> Why, there were orange groves all over this place. Okay. And uh, so uh, the fact of the matter is, what I'm getting at is weather is changing. In your lifetime, it's definitely changing. In my changed. lifetime, it's changing. Well, the weather is changing. We don't have... There was a time you could go down Interstate 4 all through this county, and all that you saw on right or left was nothing but orange trees. I remember that. I remember, remember coming that. here. I came down here in 1970. I don't know any. Yeah. And, and we've lost our citrus, and it's because of these continual freezes. So now we're... <laughs> we don't... We have some people that like Wheeler and, and Dudas that pr produce some uh, perishable vegetable crops. Uh, but we don't, this is not, it's not really the an nationally either. known farming district. Mm -hmm. It was known for celery and, and uh, vegetables and citrus along with Lake County and other counties that it once was. So we've taken a beating. And at the same time we've taken a beating, we have been flooded with new people. The paper said the other day we were the fourth smallest county in Florida. We're the third smallest. And it said we're the eighth 
densest in population, but we're the seventh densest. Only six counties of 67 <laughs> the states have more people per square mile yeah, than we yeah. do. Than Yet we do not have the industrial. We don't have all the services and everything that goes with no, it. Uh, you see, and we have homestead mm -hmm. exemption. You know what that is. No, I, I, frankly, I don't truly understand that. But <laughs> Well, there's an old man in a while, Bill Murphy, who was a senator from out in West Florida. And in the 30s, um, the, um, nobody could pay their taxes, and a lot of property reverted to the state of Florida. And while Bill Murphy, he, he was a bright old man from out in the panhandle, he said, how can we get this state moving again? This was in the first Roosevelt administration. And it occurred to him that uh, he passed an act called the Murphy Act for him. Mm -hmm. And b by this act, the state would put up these properties that they had gotten back for very small sums of money just for the taxes to do it. People began to buy properties okay. and they got Murphy, Murphy, Murphy Act deeds. But he said, how can we get these people to come here? And he did two things. He said, let's provide $5,000 of homestead exemption so that any person who owns his own home doesn't pay any real estate taxes on the first 5000 5, Now, that covered 90% of the houses in Florida. At the time, yeah. And he said, that'll bring average people down here. But then he said, we'll get the rich people because we'll put in our Constitution that there should be no inheritance taxes. We're one of the few states in the nation that you can <laughs> die without an inheritance <laughs> tax. See? So now, well, most no, people don't. Because everybody in my family has got hit with that at some point. Most yeah. people don't. Well, as an estate planner and as a probate judge and probate <laughs> lawyer for 41 years, I have, uh, I have written wills and planned the estates of hundreds of people from all over the nation, mostly east of the Mississippi, who have established Florida as their legal residence in order to die that. without inheritance taxes, which are so heavy in the New England states and mm -hmm. in uh, Illinois, Indiana, well, I have an Ohio. uncle who's paying off from 10 years ago. He's paid that farm. You know so. what it is. Yeah. So, so Senator Murphy got people, wealthy people in the North interested in Florida because you could die yeah, without inheritance here. taxes. <laughs> Not federal estate now, but state yeah. inheritance. Yeah. And he attracted worlds of people down here who could have a home and be tax-free up to 5,000. Now, and really 90% of the homes mm -hmm. in Florida were tax-free. See, we got our money to operate the state from uh, beer, wine, and whiskey, from the paramutual establishments. That's right. that high line, yeah. dog tracks, Horses. horse tracks. Uh, and after 1950, the limited uh, sales tax, which exempted groceries and drug bills, and gasoline taxes. We have the oddest tax structure of any one of the 50 <laughs> states. The <laughs> oddest by all means. We have no inheritance and no, and no state tax. taxes. We do not have any income taxes mm -hmm. on individuals. Didn't have the corporate income tax until the 70s. Mm -hmm. We don't tax automobiles. We don't tax household furnishings. Just a war we don't have a general sales tax, which covers sales tax on groceries and uh -huh. clothing and uh -huh. drugs, all kind of things. And um, but we, <laughs> the tourists, paid most of our taxes coming down here and, and on beer, wine, and whiskey and betting and, and the, the betting and the gasoline tax and that kind of thing. See, so um, the result of it was Florida really began to grow after the war. And when I came home after the war, we had two and a half million people. I think when the federal census is completed in September of 1990, this year, mm -hmm. I think it'll give us around 14 million, give or take <laughs> a half a million. Now, if you look at that thing, that's in uh, 45 years that we've gone from two and a half to around 14 Seven. million. Now, remember, every time there were 30 of those children, you had to have a new classroom. The average cost of a classroom is now around $65,000. And you had to have a teacher, and you had to have all these facilities for them and parking spaces, <laughs> see? So people didn't understand, they don't understand what my generation 
has had faced this ever since the war. We have had, there's not a county in America that every 10 years has the percentage of growth increase that we have. Mm -hmm. See, there are counties that have more people, but I'm talking mm -hmm. about the year after year after year. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and yet, um, we've kept up pretty good. And uh, until now, in this school crisis, is the first time we've ever had a We've had many crises, but this is the first time where uh, they, it's, a, it's going to be a t very difficult job to plan in the 90s for, for all the, well, let's say it this way. Since the beginning of time, and ex before 1913 when the county was formed and up till now, we have gotten, I think it's 51 schools with something like 40,000 children, 40, 42,000 students in there. We are told, the, the school people are told, that in the next 14 years they've got to duplicate that system. We've got to have 51 more schools to, to accommodate 42, 45,000 more children. Now if you get up with an airplane, it's difficult to find 51 school sites without condemning whole subdivisions. You follow me? Yeah. I don't think people realize uh, what what's ahead in this way, and um, and when, when you got to move them in and out to these schools. When when the decision was made about the interstate, did anybody foresee this business like the shopping mall coming in? Oh no! No, no! I saw, I saw Stromberg Carlson. You can nice see the industrial. I could see thing. the industrial, yeah. and I knew the land was beautiful out there, mm -hmm. and I knew that ultimately there would nice be sections. But I never foresaw, for example, Heathrow or Timucuan, places like that. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, but, but. Uh, they're, they, they're, they're just going to have, what we need more than anything is, is um, young people, business and professional types, who are original thinkers, I call them, who uh, will bring new ideas to how to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. We have a serious, serious <laughs> educational problem ahead in this county. How in the world, when you find out what it costs to build a simple <laughs> elementary school to say nothing of the cost of the land. And that fills up. <laughs> See, yeah. And you're talking about 51 schools in the next 14 years. Uh, well, how fast did the example would be? This courthouse, you're telling me, but yeah. the school system was being run by two people. Yeah, right on the right window. Got, now we've there, got, room, we now have system. lawyers and secretaries and <laughs> clerks and, you know, I mean, there must be a hundred and some people at the courthouse. Has that been relatively recent that this, that the county seat has grown as far as having county administration down here and county well, school we, board and... No, see, we were, Mr. They went has it from increased Mr. a little bit at a time? office to, uh, right over here was the old bus station, Greyhound bus station. Where was that? Right over here, uh... If you go down, uh, does it show up on this? To where the civic center, you know. Yeah. Right. Okay. You right turn over to here. the left there, the A block before street? the lakefront. Yeah, co commercial, and go okay. down to the four-way stop. Yeah. Go across. It's the second building on the right. That was the. That was a bus station. Yeah. It's like a medical building or something. No, well, yeah. uh, it's a Al Dowdney, the surveyor, bought it from us. And that's the, the bus system. station. <laughs> that was a Greyhound bus. Oh no. <laughs> now we bought that. I say we, the school system, bought that bus system when the Greyhound closed up, okay. and we converted it into the to the school administration office. So it went from there and to then the old we bus went station. From, yeah, from the bus station and, and then, then out here. Went to the New York Giants. We bought that building. from the San Francisco Giants. San Francisco Giants. Place there, who operated a little naval academy uh, there after the oh, that's right, Giants yeah, they moved were us out. And I would say that we probably have 150 to 180 now involved in the administration of the schools as against Mr. Lawton and Gertrude Gilbert. I was just saying, because the whole, I mean, this is only, yeah. it's only been 20, 30 years ago, and all the county... Uh, that was, uh, 
uh, that would have would have gone back into Mr. Back. Mill. We took over in 1952. So okay, when did it move to the bus station? It moved to the bus station sometime in the uh, around 1960. 1960. Okay. Mm -hmm. Still, that's a lot of people being added to the government. Well, people, <laughs> uh, everybody really get, now. Of course, there's an explanation for that that everybody gives, which is that we caught the overflow from Orlando, which was a sleepy little town in the 1930s, larger than we were. It had outgrown us by the 30s, but nothing like the metropolis it is yeah. now. And Orlando, we caught very quickly the people. Well, for example, you see, the Maitland now is really, um, the, the city of Maitland is in Orlando, but Maitland people live in Seminole. Winter Park's people are over I the line. I find this very confusing, you yeah. See, <laughs> where the line is now, now the people mm -hmm. long since, yeah. the line's gone. And so as Orlando kept growing and growing, they kept building in Sem South Seminole. And we had to keep building schools out there, you see. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems we've had, uh, Alicia, through the years was that you could stand on the old courthouse out in front there, Mickey Malicut, with the bat and the baseball and headed across the county line because the county line was the water. Same. Oh, right, okay. See? Mm -hmm. So everybody, <laughs> a fellow old cracker used that out in Alamont one night in a meeting. He said, why, well, Mickey Mantle could stand in front of the courthouse and hit a ball across the county line. All of the people are south of the courthouse. The courthouse belongs in Casterbury, see? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so in retrospect, you can see how the people in the South End felt. Mm -hmm. But we began to get all these people in the South End and schools that had to be built and all. And uh, we not only had problems in schools, we had problems in health care. And thanks mm -hmm. to the Florida Conference of the Seventh-day Adventists, they put Florida Hospital North up there, which helped us. And you see, we didn't have a hospital, a real hospital. Yeah, I know the We had a hospital called the Fernal Lawton Hospital. Right, so over, there. over there. You know where it is. Now that's where all of my generation was born. Mm -hmm. And a couple of doctors delivered most of us, Dr. Tover and Dr. Knox. But anyway, um, it was good that we had it. But during World War II, the Navy had a hospital out there. Not out on the air base? base. Oh, and okay. when the, the Navy base closed, uh, we, moved, we had a hospital, such mm -hmm. as it was. It was, a, it was a Navy facility, but the hospital moved from Old Fernal Lawton out there. Oh, now that I didn't know. I've yeah. never been told that. I thought it yeah. moved down to you know, just Yeah, it was out there. Okay. Now, then the Navy reactivated the base, <laughs> see, which was a great thing. We all worked for that because of the income that the thing came back. I believe it was 51 or 55 in there. But that meant we went back to the hospital, went back to Fernal Lawton. In 1950, the football season of 51 or 52, somewhere in there, my youngest brother got knocked out up at the football field behind what is now the middle school on French Avenue. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they took him down to Fernal Lock Hospital and, uh, in an ambulance, and my next youngest brother, Herb, who has his leg off, we got in his car and hustled out of the old hospital. And this was about 9.30 or 10 o'clock, and we stayed around about midnight, and we came out and we're getting ready to step into the elevator to go down to the first floor. It was just two stories. There was an elevator in the building? There wasn't. That's what I'm getting ready to tell you and how we got a new hospital. God's truth. When uh, one of the local doctors, of which there were just a handful, spoke to us and we turned and shook hands with them and chatted, and during the chat, we noticed that there was no elevator in the elevator shaft. And if that doctor had not spoken to us, her or I, one, would have gone down shaft. that shaft. And it frightened right. me. It turned out that my youngest brother, Frankie, just had a con concussion, and they yeah. left him the other day. 
But that thing bothered me. I took a look around that place. And in September of 1952, I put an ad in the Sanford Herald that everybody interested in getting a decent hospital in this county show up at that old courthouse at 8 o'clock on a Tuesday night. Well, by George, they sh showed <laughs> up. We couldn't even get them in the old ballroom, the courtroom. And uh, they were all outside. And we formed a citizens committee with Mr. George Tuey, who is still alive and who yes, ran the need. savings and loan after Mr. Cooper, the guy they had the article about that went up looking for gold. Oh, right, and yeah. saw okay. on the river. But anyway, we put together this, I learned early, the way to get things done was through citizens groups. And we went, we got the county commission to put an $800,000 bond issue on the ballot. Mm -hmm. you know? And they all said, oh, Douglas, you can't pass a bond. The people are going to vote to put taxes on their homes. See, only people who pay for it were people that own property. People didn't own any property, which was every, which was a lot of people, <laughs> black and white remember the times. They're not going to vote for for that thing. Well, I really, I really organized an outstanding group. And I borrowed my, uh, uh, I borrowed my mother-in-law's 49 Dodge. And I got a set of loud speaking equipment from the pastor of the Central Baptist Church, a man named Watley. And uh, I put it on that on that uh, Dodge because my car was an old 41 Ford. And uh, every afternoon when I left the courthouse, instead of going home, I'd go out into a precinct without that loudspeaker. There were no ordinances against loudspeakers in those days. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. And I would say, this is your county judge, Douglas Stenstrom, urging you to vote for the $800,000 bond issue so we can have decent hospital care in this county and get doctors into our town. And I got 83% of the votes that this county, the property holders, one, one town, Oveda, <laughs> split even. It was exactly even for those for and those against. And there were reasons I learned about that. But anyway, then Ambassador Bert Fish, who Mr. Roosevelt had appointed our ambassador to Egypt and the head of one of the great law firms in the land, uh, had, a, had some family here. Mrs. E.M. Galloway was his sister. And my mother nursed her. And I heard about Mr. Fish through mother and through the Galloway family. And I knew that he had died later when I was judge and they probated his estate in Volusia and he had set up a trust to provide hospital care for Deland, New Smyrna, and Sanford. Long story short, we got $450,000 out of the fish <laughs> trust. But if you go down and look yeah. at the county services building on the mm -hmm. right, you'll see Fish Memorial Wing. Oh, okay. okay. So That's now we got 800000 on the bond and four fifty dollars <laughs> out of that. At the same time, there had been in the United States Senate a great Southern Senator from Alabama by the name of Lister Hill, who with a congressman named Burton had gotten through the United States Congress the Hill-Burton Act, which provided federal funds for hospitals. So we went to work on Senator um, Smathers and Senator Holland, and we got another $400,000 of Hill-Burton funds. So with that, those uh, monies, 165, mm -hmm. we built this that hospital right down there, there okay. as a public hospital. Quite a fight about where it should be. Counties out there, yeah, <laughs> that kind yeah. of thing. How'd they arrive on that? Well, we own the land. Oh, okay. The county owned the land, and know. remember now, this was at a time we opened that place about 56. This was at a time when. If the county might probably had 50,000 people, 
and 25,000 of them would have lived within four or five miles from this water. Okay. okay. See? Now, the ones that lived like down there were going to go on to Winter Park anyway okay. into, into Florida Sand, Orlando Hospital. Was there anything on that land when they built uh, it? My anything? grandpa had that dairy there. Oh, that's where the dairy was? You see, there was no bulkhead yet. That's where the last war yeah, was fought. Right? Yeah. The last war of the Seminole War yeah. was fought right down there. Yeah. Grandpa had, had, a, had a dairy right there. Okay, I was uh, No, not the first one. The first dairy he had out there is about yeah, where the Seminole was... Community College. Yeah, I think your brother they lived about down that. here. Okay. Mill. But anyway, there was nothing there. Okay, so it's basically an empty piece so of land. So we had the property, which was a selling point. And the day that that hospital opened, I was the MC for the break, that groundbreaking of that mm -hmm. thing, as well as that blood bank down there, because was, I was also the coroner. And I knew <laughs> what not the law provided that the only judge in the county had to act as coroner. coroner. And I heard too many doctors talk about when people died, you know, and you had to have an inquest, that blood could have saved them. So I was always interested in getting blood. So we, we got this blood thing down right. here. Uh -huh. But anyway, the day that thing opened, a man from the United States Public Health Department told me there was a fine 75-bed hospital he'd been in. And so what happened? Now, my what I was aiming at was not only health care, but I had gotten involved through the JCs and this idea of money coming into the town. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you, can't, you can't increase the per capita wealth of the people without getting new money. And every time a dollar went out of town, we never saw it again. So I figured the biggest source of income, Alicia, that was the biggest amount of money leaving this town was for medical and hospital fees to Orange County. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, see? So I said, if we can get the hospital, then the money stays we here. can get the <laughs> hospital money here, and, you get the, and doctors. the doctors would begin yeah, to come. The doctors and would have all that's when Sanford turned around. In the okay. 50s, when we opened that hospital, and the doctors began to come in here, and health care, Sanford turned around in the middle of the 50s over that hospital. That's when we turned the corner from the Depression See? Okay. That's an awfully big jump from that. I can't imagine that building having been the hospital. That little... Oh, it was a temporary. Uh, I, mean, <laughs> I can't remember. It was Ms. Fernald that's allowed yeah, it to be used as a it. temporary hospital. And it just, I can't, and, I just can't imagine. And this was 1927. Mm -hmm. And the darn thing was temporary. And it's still being used by 1950. And when, Herbie, when Frankie got hurt in that football game in 1952, and I mm -hmm. thought of all the things this county needed was a hospital. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, nobody knew at that time about uh, the problems that public hospitals will have. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't believe there really wasn't any. That was the hospital for the county. That was it? Yeah, which is why everybody yeah. south of Sanford went to went well, the Park and to Orange <laughs> World. My second uh, child, my daughter Patricia, mm -hmm. was born in Orlando. But every time the money went out, mm -hmm. you see, we, we became poor. It was a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and our kids would get out of high school and go somewhere else. Well, all us boys, see, we the war, and, and we, we were trying to save the world. We were glad mm -hmm. to be, get out. Mm -hmm. and we, we, most of we just had a world of young people in public service. But anyway, uh, our, we began to turn around. We got our medical problems solved then. Then we also got the county interested in them. Uh, in that program over there where they would take care of um, young young ladies that were expecting oh, say mm -hmm. over on French Avenue oh. over there to give shots and things and we had a nice county program going county mm -hmm. doctor program like health. county health program mm -hmm. so we, we we did real well in that and and then of course we outgrew this hospital mm -hmm. and um, there were those in the media that said that if Mr. Smith was carried into the hospital at midnight, that they had a right to go in his room and see his chart. If it's a public hospital, that, that was under the sunshine law. There's public information? 
<laughs> I heard that. Oh, you run into questions. Not only that, that. <clears throat> employees had the right under certain acts. Uh, you couldn't, you couldn't hire and fire the way you could do in a, in a private hospital. Mm -hmm. For example, you could know that a nurse was stealing drugs, but you better not fire her. She had to be given the reason for it, and you had to have it. evidence. Mm -hmm. Okay. And many people wouldn't knew it, but wouldn't wouldn't give the evidence. You see. Well, what did they do about the business with patients' charts being private? Oh, well, I Was took the position as attorney for the hospital that they couldn't have them. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we uh, there's a huge difference, Alicia, in the operation of a public hospital and a private hospital. Mm -hmm. And of course, we had so much um, indigent care. Mm -hmm. And I think I may have mentioned one time to you that if somebody from New York going to Miami with his family to get a job or something like that mm -hmm. had a had an accident out here right. on Interstate yeah. Four, and they hauled him in for a little Seminole Memorial, the minute they brought him in the emergency room behind the white curtains. We had to take care of them, even yeah. though they may not have any money to pay, yeah. not have any insurance, and you were subject to malpractice yeah. suits. When I know just since I've lived See. in Florida for three years now, there's been all that problem with private hospitals you turning know. somebody away, yeah. and then the county hospital has to yeah. take them. Yeah. Private hospitals, yeah. or public hospitals are going out, and they're becoming the places where people say that the health care is not as good. Yeah. I'm not sure that's true. Well, I mean, I've heard that all my life in Atlanta. But when we had the opportunity to, 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 to let the Hospital Corporation of America buy it, take us over and come in here That's and build a 20 to $30 million dollar facility okay. down there and still let us keep the building, which eliminated the need for another big expensive courthouse wing, which oh. would have gone on that, <laughs> right. that, 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 that yeah. parking lot down there. You know what I'm talking uh, about? Yeah, oh yeah. See? Uh -huh. That's when this thing all worked out and we took bids and they took the county commission, chose hospital corporation. So that's actually private money came in and bought yeah, bought that, the right to build the hospital. Right, and it was under the leadership of Commissioner William Kirchhoff that they commissioned that that. And we ended up down here mm -hmm. with this marvelous facility, mm -hmm. up to date in every respect and architectural, built by people that own 70, 80 hospitals, hospitals and yeah. knew all the bugs right. in it, see, there, ended up not having to build another courthouse. <laughs> <a good> deal. <laughs> now, they spent quite a bit of remodeling it, yeah. see, like that. Now, the one bad thing about that, Alicia, Still looks like a hospital, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. But the bad thing about that thing was, you see, we took all those people that would have employed downtown, and they're out there. And yeah. that... I feel didn't hurt, didn't help downtown. I am told by the people downtown that they don't feel that way. They don't feel that uh, that, that jeopardized safety. Yeah, but see, there is a question that we have come up and we're trying to figure out. Oh, see, we had a lot of questions from people who come on Amtrak and they don't understand the town. You know, they're, they're seeing the town through tourist eyes. One of the things that we haven't understood is with as many county employees as you have here during the day, yeah. you can just barely keep a sandwich shop operating downtown, which doesn't make any sense. All those employees well, should have to be looking for a place to get a hamburger or yeah. a sandwich or okay. something. So there must be something wrong with the fact that these people don't go downtown. Well, Alicia, it kind of stands to they don't go shopping that downtown. If all these people that are working in that building down there together with all of the citizens who have to go to that building down yeah. there with respect to different types of licenses and mm -hmm. assessments and all, we're coming downtown mm -hmm. at that parking lot down there yeah. or some other, this block right over here that crosses the street from the oh, chamber. The one that's empty. A vision, if you will, of public facilities building there. Mm -hmm. Then you can believe that there wouldn't be any trouble operating a sandwich shop. Am that's, I right? Yeah, that's what I do. I mean, it's not that far, yeah. but yeah. it's very unlikely. If I'm working yeah. down there as a secretary, I'm probably not going to walk all the way down uh -huh. five blocks no, to go get a sandwich. Now, I, I, I thought about that. Yeah. I really did. And um, I don't know how much business that brings in, but I know there are a lot of people who go shopping at their lunch hour and they, they run errands, they go to the bank, whatever, you know. 
So I don't know how much I don't they think, lost. I don't think this program, which was mm -hmm. top flight for health care, yeah. top flight for health care, from the standpoint of county financing, mm -hmm. was a tremendous achievement. Oh, yes, great. <laughs> See, but the truth of the matter is, and along with it, on the minus side, I can't help but believe by taking all those county employees out there with all the, I've been down there for different mm -hmm. things. So mm -hmm. people things down there. about when you move you have to mm -hmm. apply for And there's homes. always cars, all the all the parking spaces are you always full. You can go down there and they're always there. Now you put all those people and all those cars down here, it's that bound to hurt first street. Yeah. That seems logical to me. That makes sense. But anyway, we've done well in the health care. We're getting our doctors there was no reason in the world for us to lose this heart uh, facility that the county H.C. applied mm -hmm. for and got turned yeah, down on it next time we'll get it. But uh, Is this hospital actually expanding? I mean, are they, are they growing? Is it no. going places uh, wait a or minute. is it stalling? Yeah, but now, Alicia, if, if uh, most people don't know, the government controls the number of beds available. Oh, okay. No, I didn't now, know. if they approve of a hospital across the river in Tiberia, then that it. kind of damages us. Uh, yeah, look okay. at the admissions list. It's going to terribly hurt yeah. this hospital. Because once again, you're right next to the county line. <laughs> yeah, there's a line. Yeah, right. And they're all over there. Enterprise. How did it manage? Another thing people ask us is, how do we manage to end up with a, a city building, a county building, a federal building, a city building, a city park? A private nonprofit organization, all on the prime property on the waterfront. Well, People are amazed that we don't have, you know, condominiums or a shopping area or something on the waterfront. How did the post office, for example, end up with a piece of waterfront property for a post office? I, I don't know. Well, you know where the old post office was. Is it the, yeah, the library building? Yeah. Um, they bought the government bought that. Property. I was just wondering because a lot of people ask. They said because we've got a uh, you know federal. Then the county owns the parking lot. The county owns the courthouse and the city. All the property that would be um, developed is well, all. Well, I don't think they probably up. realized. <laughs> was that intentional or was that just no, by accident? I think, I think it was just the times. You see, this was we're talking about eight in the 1880s. As far as well, the city. Well, yeah, some of it. Some of it being set so, up, but it's uh, like land wasn't. You know, what but what I'm saying is, like, the, when the courthouse, you said there was there was empty land, the old courthouse, that yeah. was empty next to that. The post office used to be down here; it wasn't on the waterfront. Yeah. yeah. The, you know, and they built that marina and everything, but they blocked up all of the land with government uh, facilities. Yeah. The 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 county instead of um, that was debated at the time. Because we have a lot of people asking. We, as a staff, we're confused about the fact that you have. We have a lot of people on those boats out there who we think probably never come into First Street because they're blocked yeah. visually by That's a parking true. lot That's and a, a very good post analysis. office and that kind of thing. Well, and I so think that it question had to do. It was an old, old town, and uh, the that was who had the money to buy the land, I guess. Well, I think that was a logical place, yeah. just like in Savannah. Yeah. The logical place for the, the uh, city to have its property and, yeah. and that sort of thing, and the town just built up along the. How did, was when the New Tribes Mission? Do you remember when they when they bought this building? Yeah, was, that in, was, really, was that seen as being a really? Was that seen as being a good deal for the city? That was the biggest white elephant in Sanford. That's that was, was the old Forest Lake Hotel, because it was the it Naval was, Academy when they bought it. Yeah, it? yeah, and it was always a white elephant, and. Um, they bought it, and, and it's been a plus mark in, mm -hmm. in the sense that it hasn't been a white elephant. They keep it up, but I think they exempt from taxes as a religious. I just want because we we have a lot of people come down here visit the museum. They're very nice people. The building yeah. is beautifully cared for and all, but we have once again we have tourists ask if that's a hotel. You know they want to know why it's you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, My junior uh, senior prom was down. Do you remember was it was it in the ballroom? That's yeah. their chapel yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, our junior senior prom. Did they put the band up in the little gallery that's mm -hmm. up on the top? Was that a well, musician's gallery? Well, it has gallery? been, yeah. But okay. there also is, uh, there's another place there. It used to be that was a step up where the band played okay. in the ballroom. Uh, last time I was there, I, I was dancing there with my wife, and I bumped into Senator Dirksen, who was a great American senator from mm -hmm. Illinois. Right. And... Um, he had Dirks and Boulevard. I was going to ask, is there's a street over there named that? Did he, did he live, the, have a house over there or something? He had a 
college in uh, DeBerry. And I believe Miss Dirksen, I guess she's gone now, but till she, till she died, she, she lived there. there. And they named that Dirksen Boulevard. And he used to come over here to Krusty Roseman was his doctor. Yeah. And, uh, but he was a great senator. But uh, they, we, we had a lot of good times. And then Stetson had, they couldn't have dances over there. It was a Baptist I school, no dances. Oh. So Stetson's fraternities always had their dances down here. And, um, so you could get away with it as long as you weren't in the <laughs> yeah. campus. <laughs> yeah, and uh, they, it was a lot of civic affairs down there. But Was that mostly when the Giants owned it, that all those things were here? Uh, some of it, yeah, when the Giants owned it, yeah. But it was named for Forest Lake. Yeah, then we have... Yeah, we have that information. Character. Yeah. Do you know about him? <laughs> um, I know a little bit about him, and we acquired a copy of Small Town South because we understood that was all about his administration and everything. But, um, And it's a confusing name. We tell people it's a Hotel Forest Lake. It sounds like it was a made-up name for the hotel yeah, yeah. rather than... So it really was named for him, right? That's him. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Lake was the biggest man in town. What was he doing building a hotel? That's all I'm interested in. He was the mayor and the president of the bank, state legislator, and the he local kind of the editor town boss. Got, went after him and convicted him of embezzlement. Yeah, that's Roland the penitentiary. Dean. Roland. Okay. When he was young, that was in the in the late twenties, and Mr. Dean because Bobo carried Dean, a pistol who is to a... protect himself. Roland was a all were real intellectual and so was his wife. We never had private people. And, um, but the thing about Mr. Lake, uh, he taught a tremendous Sunday school class at First Methodist Church up there mm -hmm. with 100 or 200 of the most prominent men in Sanford. And we have a picture of Mr. Lake and that family. And he was, oh, I remember he was just a little boy. He was just, just a powerful person. Right. And then uh, when he got out of prison, he had been broken, and my father was, uh, had gone bankrupt when the chain stores came out, when, oh. what's now Winn-Dixie and all, and it lost his business. So he had to go to work with Mr. Davis, who was the founder of Winn-Dixie. And I worked in the store too. And Mr. Uh, Lake would come to the, down the alleys and would come to the back of the store and I would see I was about, this would have been 33, 32, 33, so I would have been 11, 12. And he would, you'd find him with his cane, he was an old man, and fishing in the, in the trash cans. Is it a man who'd been running the town and I, he went down yeah. that far? Yeah. I never, even as a boy, that thing made an impression on me, and I felt sorry for Mr. Boy. Lake. But he was not mentally right then, and uh, but he had no money, and he was kind of blubbered, and, mm -hmm. and he, he, he would go in the kitchen to get ripe tomatoes and ripe bananas and things like that. Out so he just control. kind of became one of these town people who wanders the streets, everybody knows who it is. Yeah, and it, it was a mark, and Daddy and Mother both told me, he said, now that's can, what can happen to you. But uh, Lake was a big man. But anyway, that's health care. We've talked about the roads, <laughs> and we've talked about the schools, and we've talked some about the courthouse. And oh, before we got off the hotel, though, we did have somebody, um, it was a teenager, who's living down there right now with his parents. And he was talking about having seen photographs of the front, of the waterfront of the building. That of it used building? to of the, of the hotel, the yeah. Mayfair. That it used to, that the pictures he saw, it looked like there was more to the front. Did there used to be any kind of a marina or anything out no, there? Oh, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a wooden... Uh, with wooden, some kind uh, of a pier or something? Pier, a wooden pier okay. out about... Because he, he made it sound like there was something in front of the building in the water. There was a wooden it was about six feet wide, and it must have gone out about 100 feet. Okay. Yeah, and then of course right down there where our present marina is, you know, we mm -hmm. had a warehouse, which is where the people on the uh, boats that would come down from Jacksonville. I think we have a picture of that. Yeah, yeah. 
would come down there and get off and come to there. Here? And okay. I was there the night that thing caught on fire and uh, burned up that when big did that warehouse. Happen? Oh, it must have been in the late 30s. Mm -hmm. The warehouse burned you up. Just Mr. Caldwell <laughs> operated that thing. The whole thing burned down. But see, boats would come down and unload supplies and, and right. trucks would pick them up and take them different places. But also the tourists, I mean the people, would come down on the... What kind of boats are you talking about by that time? What type of boats? Uh, well, it, we didn't have the, the tour boats uh, in the Depression. Yeah. and They had them in the 20s. I mean, do you remember, I've had people tell me that they still remember a, a paddle wheel boat coming up oh, to about yeah. 1930. Well, do you I remember those? Yeah, yeah. Okay. This was, they stopped about uh, about the time of the well, of the uh, stock market crash in 1929. And then the boats that would come after that were um, freight boats, big boats that haul freight. Okay. And um, they unloaded. You go in the warehouse and you'd see all kind of staples. And, uh, trucks would come and get and then haul mm -hmm. grocery stores and places. Okay. So basically everything went from being, this answers some gaps, going from the train meeting the boat and hauling everything out, instead it became trucks came down yeah. and picked up the oil That's or right. picked up the goods or whatever. That's right. Okay. That's right. And um, then the coast, the railroads, of course, began yeah. to go down. As airplanes yeah. came along, and the trucking industry grew. And was the railroad station over on Ninth Street? Well, when you the were first one was up? down there. No, I, no, the old one was the down there. But one. was that still operating though when you were growing up, or had they mm -hmm. already moved it over it to was the? It over there. Okay. And then um, they stopped, and the first Girl Scouts were organized and met down there, and the. Old post, old depot. Oh really? Oh, I yeah. didn't know that. That's and then we got our new depot out there yeah. on Nice Street, and then we got another new right. depot out here. And um, that's the one thing I don't quite understand is the jump from the when they built the new one and then then tore that down and went way out there. I haven't quite understood why they moved all the way, why the has, tracks and everything ended up way out in the middle of nowhere. I don't really know either. Because now we really don't have my way of thinking it's not a railroad station like it used to be I mean that's not that's a hole in the wall no, <laughs> it's um, it's not used uh, I completely missed that I tried to take somebody out there one day and completely missed the road to get to the railroad station people don't take the train out of here mm -hmm. anymore very much but we're doing that well that's another story but the uh, what was uh, the where the Pico the Pico building next to where the state? What was that when the station was still there when you were growing up? Well, that building there, uh, the Pico building. Yeah, I know it was originally a hotel and a restaurant, but a what rest was it by the time? Was it still a restaurant? Uh, when you were when up? I was growing up, it was empty. It was empty. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in fact, when I my law firm, which I began in the Edwards building right next to it, okay. there was nothing in the Pico building, and so that building was bought by Howard McNulty whose family started what is now the bank up there, the Sun Bank, but that was the old oh, Magnolia okay. Bank, call it the Florida State Bank. Uh, Howard bought that building and remodeled it and rented okay. it, and that's where Mac Cleveland started his his law, firm, law office in there, but that building has been there all the time. And then behind it is the Edwards Building, uh, which used to belong to the Tacashes and was known okay. as the Tacash yes. Building. Okay. And they had a, a restaurant too, I believe. They, now we have pictures from the 1890s that a Mrs. Tacash ran a restaurant in the Pico Building. Yeah, I she actually had one in there. The Originally, she yeah. had one on the first floor. Yeah. And maybe they moved back to the building. Yeah. Is that the building right and up next against it? Mm -hmm. That's what was the Tacash? Okay. Yeah. I used to go over there uh, 50 years ago to a little restaurant. But um, the town really grew up. The fort was down there, see, and Fort Mellonville. Of course, now that's Mellonville. <laughs> yeah. We try to make it very clear to visitors that yeah. that's Mellonville, and this was yeah. Sanford, and that the two then yeah. got put together. Now this this street right up here, the next street, not the yeah. lakefront, is known used to be Union known, Avenue. Yeah, <laughs> that was to unite yeah. the two towns. We finally caught on to that one. We had people keep referring to it Union Avenue, and we finally found Union. an explanation that it united the two two places. Yeah, I did. So, I am. Yeah. Then Sanford was a big, big man. 
people around here have never known what a really but big man he was. But see, we do find that the average person who's grown up here, the, the, what they've been taught is that Mellonville became Sanford. They have not been taught that this man came in and planned a new town that was completely separate from Mellonville. So we try to emphasize that, that it was a whole new city, that it had yeah. nothing to do with, that Mellonville was a separate town. Yeah. Because most people really, they, they don't have any idea that somebody came in from outside and Alicia, poured money we were never way. taught that for some yeah. reason in the public schools. We were never taught about General Sanford. King Leopold himself once wrote to Sanford to say that Sanford's contributions in Africa mm -hmm. and the Congo mm -hmm. were such that his name would be linked with King Le Leopold and in it, history. It is pretty much. It's not, he's not as well known as they put, but that's no. the one thing that we have more inquiries about than anything else is the Congo. He's better known for the Congo yes, than it is. anything else. What's sad about it is that all the research that we're doing is this, what he was planning on doing with the city and the way the company was building the city was, you know, it's really something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all the things that he had planned, yeah. and there's not been a lot of research. We keep trying to get people interested in coming in and working on the town papers, but that's something else is we have to collect the rest of the story because there are a lot of papers we don't have uh, from the other people who yeah. worked with him. So there's a lot of mystery. But we've tried to emphasize, that's what you need, we had to have you come down and be a tour guide, um, because what we're trying to emphasize is the fact that uh, that he planned the town with a company, that a company built the town. Because yeah. one thing that a lot, a lot of, of right, a lot of people in town are confused about is they, they think he was some carpetbagger Yankee who came down here and just tried mm -hmm. to tell people what to do, who were running their own little town. Yeah. They don't seem to realize that he built a town that That's, wasn't here, yeah, you know? Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it was starting yeah. from scratch and that the company that a bunch That's of Englishmen it, actually it. paid for the town. Yeah. So we just flat out, we tell people that it was a business venture, but that he, it was. because of his asthma, it was also a, uh, you know, a place for him to get away from the bad weather in the winter. But we're now finding that he came here for about two months out of the year. He'd come here in the winter from what we well, can he page had a, out. He had a substantial career in the 1880s, long yeah. after he got... Well, see, the, well, the only problem is the last 20 years of his life when he was building the city are the worst part of his life, really, yeah, because his fortune uh, started failing and yes. his career started failing and everything. The only thing was the Congo, the work with the Congo, but even that didn't come out to what he wanted it to be. So, but we have just, I'm just honest with people now. I, when I first started out talking about him, I didn't just flat out say he was a real estate speculator, but basically that's what he was doing. He was speculating on building a city that would, he did, and he was a good businessman from laying out everything like you're talking about see he you probably love talking to this guy <laughs> he's all he's talking about, about the money not coming in from outside that seems to be what he sat down and studied what types of oranges can you grow here that people will export from florida to italy or spain or what can we make money off of that seems to be well it's the very thing because what he did was he brought in all these varieties we have all the papers where he um he'd write to botanical gardens and things like that and uh, have italian or Spanish or Moroccan varieties of citrus sent here, and he did studies on how much money the United States was spending on importing foreign citrus fruit, mm -hmm. and how much money Florida could make mm -hmm. if they grew the citrus fruit instead. And then he's one of the first people to crate it up and ship it out as gift packages and that kind of thing. So we have all the papers about how many crates of oranges he was shipped out and who they went to, and he sent them to people all over the world. But, but that's, you know, the thing is is that some people don't, there's nothing particularly romantic about that. I mean, the man did not come with his, his wagon and his, you know, his household belongings on his back and, you know, build the city with a oh, hammer. It so it's, yeah, but he was a, a businessman, yeah. you know. He was sort of, we the had books. somebody say, oh, he's like Donald Trump. And in some ways, he was, he was sort of, entrepreneur. yeah, made his money from but he also, uh, really speculating think, and uh, that he <clears> may have been motivated primarily that way. Mm -hmm. But like a lot of things in life, Alicia, they're both selfish and unselfish. Lots of things are. Oh, sure. Well, there's... And I think that he he really was interested in developing the citrus industry, uh, developing yeah. citrus, mm -hmm. call it a, a something or another. And uh, also, I think that that health problem is mm -hmm. motivated. But it's a combination. What we seem to have is a man who was advised that this was a good business investment, so he found a way to make it a better business investment, which was to okay. have better riverboat traffic uh, yeah, schedule, yeah. improve the citrus, bring in the railroad, so yeah. that makes it a better business. 
Plus, it was a place he could escape from the bad weather for his health. Yes, sir. And, he, and the things he did, we have now found that he was going to move here permanently. He was going to retire here, basically, and his wife stopped him from doing it. Is that so? Yeah, the Chase family, uh, Sidney uh, Chase's home, is sitting on the plantation house site. And we found a letter from Mrs. Sanford that um, she stopped her husband after his death. She wrote a letter to a friend saying that she stopped her husband from building the plantation house because they had seven children, five of whom were still in school when he died, mm -hmm. or when, towards the end of his life, and that they couldn't afford to move here. We also think she didn't really want to move here. But, mm -hmm. you know, but, but So we do think that he probably intended to. His career was slowing down, and he wanted to leave Belgium and come to the United is States. That so? Yeah, the, the thing is, is he, there are some rather bitter letters towards the end of his life where, she, where he wrote to her that she was keeping him from moving back to the United States and saving money. So yeah. it appears that he's not quite as much of the, the Yankee foreigner, <laughs> you know, that he would have. He just, he had too many commitments. He had too many things that kept him commuting back and forth, so he couldn't stay here. But his son, we've now found that Harry lived here for two years. Is that Harry so? ran Bel Air for two years, and we found a reference to the fact that he ran for mayor. Because is that we, right? We can't find anything to document that I at this didn't point. Know what what that. we have there is a letter. That is a letter from Henry Sanford. I should show it to you, um, in is which that he. Running?